okay. then uh, we'll see how this goes. All right, okay, and we are live. So good evening, everybody. Um, how has, I, I hope everyone's doing well this evening. I think it's been quite some time since we last seen each other, you know, after, uh, during this election and, and all this as well. And so um, I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, myself as well as our guests. Okay, so my name is Lee Singh. If you're first time joining us, uh, my name is uh, Lee Singh, and I'm quite nervous right now. Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm the founder of uh, Green Nudge from this channel itself. We are a social enterprise which really supports businesses as well as communities to try and achieve, uh, create positive environmental impact. Okay, we do it through activities, uh, outreach like this, as well as uh, sustainable consulting. All right, and this evening, uh, we are actually very, very happy you know, to have someone all the way from Australia. And um, his name is Yen. And Yen is actually a, what we call a, a behavioral change specialist. All right, and I'll leave, you know, I'll, I'll leave um, Yen to introduce more about himself uh, and, and share about what, what we hope to achieve uh, today. All right, over to you, Yen. Okay, so hi. Hi, everyone. My name's Yen. A uh, little bit about myself. I used to be in a performance arts group for like 10 years before I decided to take up a bachelor's in communication and journalism. And after that, I went into events, organized uh, Singapore's first zombie run, raised the date. 2013, went on to music events after that, and then I went on to sales and marketing before I was uh, introduced to um, this documentary called Before the Flood by Leonardo DiCaprio. So the title really got me because of its uh, biblical connotations, Before the Flood. And right there, I was exposed to all the sustainability issues. Uh, in 2016, couldn't find... Um, I wouldn't say couldn't find, I wasn't exactly surrounded by the people who are in the whole sustainability sphere. So I decided to, uh, after I got married, I decided to take up a master's in, uh, right here in Melbourne, Australia, the Master's of Environment and Sustainability in Monash University. And yeah, so here I am, just graduated la late last year and uh, currently stuck here in lockdown 2.0. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, I, I must say it's 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 probably a timely uh thing to also share, and it comes into mm -hmm. today's uh topic as well, really on yeah. nudging itself. So so I guess um I think many of you would see that behind me there's the the black the background green nudge itself. <laughs> okay, so we really wanted to uh leverage on what we call behavioral insights to really get people to kind of um you know make a choice in trying to do something good for the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, you know, even as we were starting along to do this, we actually received a lot of people who were very interested in understanding what green nudge was. I think usually people just think that, oh, a nudge is just like, you know, a poke or just a very simple uh -huh. nudge in a way. And I think there's a lot more to it. I think it is very useful that uh, we have Ian today to just really kind of share with us what this means, both from a uh, more formal <coughs> understanding, but try to reduce it to something simpler for everyone to understand. And of course, to see how we can leverage on this concept to get more people to look at uh, doing more good for the environment. Okay. So um, I will just quite quickly dive in here. So, so Ian, what, what, what does it actually mean by nudging? Or what is this nudge that everyone uh, now seems to talk about for now, uh, from um, in the you know, last, few, last few months? Mm -hmm. Last few months. Um, nudge has been around, I mean, I wouldn't say it's been around for it's, it's the, coin, the term was first coined in like 2008-2009 by uh, Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein who actually wrote a book called Nudge and what they did was a, a big portion of their studies was based on the um, behavioral insights by uh, uh, academics like Dan Daniel Kahneman and uh, Amos Tversky and Nudge is basically uh, in the words of uh, Richard Taylor is a small feature in an environment that attracts our attention and uh, alters our behavior. So nudge is a nudge, although it is a term that you don't really hear in Singapore. Um, a nudge, how do I put it? Wait, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little nervous right now. A nudge, a nudge is a behavioral uh, insight term that it's. The, the thing about nudge is if you don't really hear about it, in a way, it's done its job. Um, because it's not supposed to be like a huge billboard that gets your attention and forces you in one direction. 
So I think we have some examples of nudge that uh, uh, that leasing has that you can bring up. Okay, yeah. So on that note itself, let me just bring up some uh, examples to see whether uh, is it easier to kind of illustrate those points uh, using this. All right, okay. Um, is everyone able to see, see this? And so, yep, okay. So, yep. because we are, uh, okay, so for those who are in Singapore, I think we will, you will realize that we have just started or we have just completed, I know, our uh, general elections. And I think mm -hmm. this came along um, quite a number of times, uh, which is that in the articles that we have, we have quite a lot of people sharing about, um, uh, I mean, the, the newspapers shared a bit about um, how many people have cast their vote at a certain timing. And it also mm -hmm. shows photos and um, just a rough estimate of how many people have voted really. So Ian, what, how, what does this mean for, uh, in terms of considering it a nudge? So the, the way Channel News Asia, in a way, I'm not sure if it's intentional or um, always purposeful, but by, by, by um, releasing this news coverage, uh, like at different times of the day during the elections actually encourages people to go down to, to vote. So mm. it works on this term called social proofing, where uh, people will, when they, when they find out that people are like, oh wait, there's like 30% people voting, like 350,000 people has voted at 10 a.m., you know, they will feel like in order to be part of the society, they will go down and vote. Um, the pictures of the long queue uh, might play an unintended effect where people might actually be discouraged to vote if they see the long queue. But the whole idea of which I believe this article uh, did, did work in a way is that it encourages a lot more people to vote. And true enough, this election saw the highest voter turnout since independence uh, in this in, in this like 50 over years of voting, you know, this is mm -hmm. one of the, this actually, this is not one of the highest, this is the highest. And it could be that this works as a nudge or it could be that in the this other pandemic, at play everyone, as well. yeah, in the pandemic, everyone's stuck in Singapore. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah I, I know, obviously in Singapore, uh, it's compulsory to vote as well. So I think mm -hmm. there's also, I'm just trying to draw the difference between that right. um, people are, and uh, so people may feel the urge to want to come and vote right now as compared to mm -hmm. saying like I have I can choose to vote so that's a different in context of Singapore it is mandatory to vote and it's just that instinctively it does encourage people to say maybe you can consider going down to vote yeah all right so how about this picture uh, now that we are coming <laughs> to the topic of pandemic yeah so this is in uh this is a this is in Brooklyn Park these circles are drawn as a, as a form of social distancing okay uh so this works as a nudge where a nudge does not restrict people. It doesn't uh, restrict people from doing what they want to do, but it okay. does guide them into certain directions. Mm -hmm. And this is one of them. You can see the circles kind of just created um, <coughs> a boundary. It's not a full-on wall, you know. And oh, something wants the image. I s yeah. Sorry, I'm just seeing a straight white line right now. Okay. I so think it's not, it's so you can see. Like, yeah. So you can see the circle is not, it's not a full on wall. It doesn't just block people out. There's no door, there's no locks. It's just a guidance to uh, encourage people to maintain their distance, but while also being able to enjoy the great outdoors, even though, you know, we are told to stay at home, which we should. But if you really want to go out, you know, <clears throat> in, in, in the US, it's not a mandatory to stay home. Uh, but if you really want to go out, this works as a nudge to maintain your distancing and hopefully prevent more infections. So, in other words, it's like instead of telling people to stay apart mm -hmm. verbally, they yeah. just encourage you to just stay in your own circle. And by mm -hmm. doing so, you actually are actually being apart already. Yeah, in, yeah, I mean, being told verbally to stay apart is a nudge as well. Mm -hmm. Although we know that some people can be quite rebellious. Yep. Uh, sometimes they are told, and there's this thing called the reactance phenomenon, which is a behavioral phenomenon where uh, the more you tell them what not to do, the more they want to do. Okay. So in a way, nudges work. There are different elements that come together to help um, to help people uh, point to point people towards 
a certain behavior. So it okay. can be the verbal speech, it can be this circle, it can be an arrow, it can be a number of factors that come into it to achieve a certain outcome. Yeah. Okay. So then, okay, so I have another picture as well. It, it's very similar mm -hmm. to this. Uh, and I must say it's a really beautiful picture that has been yeah. sh shared before. Uh, this picture, it's also a very similar kind of uh, inviting people to stay mm -hmm. in the space itself. How about this? So as, as similar to the previous picture, there, there are no walls. Uh -huh. um, the thing about this, this is in Poland. This is the Galleria L. I, can't, I don't really know the full name of it. Um, they were also faced, in a way, they were also facing a drought, I think, at that point of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they, needed to main, they needed to balance out mowing the grass too much. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so this was designed by the director to kind of like, you know, we want people to come. We want to eventually hold our events in the future, uh, which, which they do a lot in this lawn. And, but we want to be mindful that, you know, the pandemic is ongoing, there's no vaccine, we need people to maintain their social distancing, and, but we want people to come here. So, so she, had, she had this great idea of uh, doing this checkerboard lawn where the tall grass will not stop people from, you know, really just jumping onto it if they want to. But, you know, you usually would, like if you see a shorter grass, you, that's where you'll go. Okay. Or okay. like set up your picnic mats and stuff. I see. Yeah, so, so again, it's yeah. non. It's in a way non verbal It kind of just invites people to make a choice, yeah. and then you kind of mm -hmm. go along with that. Yeah. I'm right? sure there are signs there as well, telling people you know maintain okay. your social distancing. Yeah. True. True. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. Okay. But must say this is also a quite uh, uh, it sounds quite operationally challenging to do it in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can do this for Padang or we can do this for uh some soccer fields. I think it will be quite maybe quite the circles la. painting the white lines in the, in the Padang that would okay. actually be more uh effective true okay now this one this coming one, one um this is very common i think in and all of, mm. everywhere in, in singapore and perhaps in australia as well and i think this is taken in australia so mm -hmm. yeah for, for this one i think it's a bit of uh yeah uh how do i say it seems to be a little bit different here because we have both mm. crosses as well as the arrows arrows so i think it yeah so do we stand on the cross or do we stand on the arrow itself <laughs> arrows I think what this aims to do is, I mean, I, I wasn't around when, because this is obviously in an Australian supermarket. Um, and I think this was a reaction to the whole pandemic. So this was like maybe like day one or day two when they, were, they had to do a lockdown and social distancing was introduced. So you can tell it's pretty crude the way they do those things. And it looks like that what I'm trying to encourage is a one-way um, aisle. So they mm. don't even like, walk both ways end up crossing each other and getting too close so they want to have, achieve a one way out and the access is kind of just to tell you you know if you're standing here if someone's standing here you should stand there um it it may not tell a lot it may not give a lot of information to the customers mm -hmm. um, but I'm, i think in, in at some point it reminds them to maintain their distances yeah so i, I suppose for this one right it has to be really uh Everyone has to work together in, this, in terms of getting an understanding that everyone should yeah. stand on the, the cross or yep. along the arrows. Mm. And, along, along and the once line. again, okay. you know, it, it doesn't stop people from going against traffic you know, okay. if they want to. True. So it's True. a nudge in a way that you know, you sh they should do this, but they can choose not to. <laughs> okay. So we're halfway through the entire uh, sharing itself, uh, the, the photos, right? But I'm just going to jump into mm -hmm. this one. This one, I think it's pretty common and I think this is I would like to consider this is also like a, a green nudge of some sort all right so mm -hmm. for those who can see this um, the photo itself is actually um, I suppose it's more like a litter bin and it's meant yep. to collect uh, cigarette butts and what we have here interestingly is that the cigarette butt it comes in a letter box of some sort and that um, on just above the, the letter box itself it actually has a question and it invites people uh, who smokes to place their cigarette butts inside the bin based on their response to the question. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is called a, a ballot bin. Ballot right? bin, yeah. Yeah. So this was cool, first, right? this, yeah, this was first introduced in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember seeing a few other variations like who is your favorite soccer player, Ronaldo or Messi. And I think this is a brilliant idea given that cigarette butts are one of the most prevalent plastic ways that we find along the beach, you know, that Greenlash has done, you know, pick, uh, doing the coastal cleanups. 
And the thing about this is it can be adjusted accordingly. Right now we see it's very printed on, right? Yeah, uh, there are other variations of the ballot bin where it's pretty much just a whiteboard or a, a, a little screen where they can just change the words on the spot. They can just put um, who's your favorite soccer player, who, given the recent Singapore elections, who would you vote for? Who would you vote for? That. So it can be timely, it can be culturally relevant, uh, it can even be written in another language, or it can mm -hmm. be just two pictures. Uh, I can't think of any right now, but it can be okay. just images and people can just choose, vote accordingly by putting their cigarette butts in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so and I think what is interesting here is this, I think people will focus more on the fact that on the question and then they'll answer accordingly, right? And I think yep. what has not been articulated here is that it helps to actually, mm -hmm. because of people participating by placing the cigarette butts into the bin itself, mm -hmm. you actually see yep. less cigarette butts around the area. Yeah. And that actually then this, uh, encourages people not to litter. And it actually also then mm -hmm. helps to reduce littering, uh, the, the, the rate of littering or the incidence yeah. of littering also. So it's, it's, it's a good idea, right? I must say, mm -hmm. I, I think we should do more of this in Singapore also. It's a not great idea. Lecture, where... <laughs> not just for lecture. I mean, it can be for anything. So for anything. Uh, doing when and if and when uh, the pandemic commits, when the EPL comes back, you know, it can be changed into like, who's your favorite soccer team? Uh, who do you think will win the championship? Yep. Stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm, okay. I'm just going to jump into one more, uh, two more. Okay. And then we'll uh, kind mm -hmm. of uh, close this as well. This is an interesting one. This is more like a, a green nudge as well. And it takes, it takes form in a different way. You could just share a little bit more about this one that you see. So this one, uh, obviously they're trying to get people to use less of the paper towels while also at the same time indicating how many paper towels there are left. Uh, so it shows that the more you use, the more green, the more trees are being cut down, save the planet, all that kind of thing. Although we would probably think that the paper napkins that's being displayed is hopefully recycled. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it gets people to think twice about wiping their hands after they are uh, using a paper towel so they can use the, uh, the dryers and stuff like that. But given that there are also uh, uh, what do you call it, issues that come with the hair, the hand dryers. Hand dryer, yeah. Public, yep. In public toilets, they are known to also be like, you know, a haven for bacteria. Yep. Uh, so it gets people thinking. It doesn't stop you from drying your hands, but it gets you to think about, you know, my actions count. I want to dry my hands, you know, uh, how many times how many of these paper towels have I used and how many trees have been cut down because of it? Stuff like that. It gets people thinking. Okay. So that this is actually, I, I, I'm interested in this because this mm -hmm. is intuitively kind of encouraging people to use less, right? Yep. Um, would it kind of change that say if, because it shows how the country or how the continent itself is changing with less paper, would it actually, would the novelty of this actually encourage more people to go in? Pull additional paper and see how it's <laughs> like, you know. There, take picture um, after that and after the Instagram. <laughs> well, like I mean, we have seen like even during this pandemic, we've seen people who, you know, to quote the Dark Knight, uh, we've just we've seen people who just want to watch the world burn. So there are people like that. There mm -hmm. are people who would just be outright rebellious. But the thing okay. with Nudge Theory is, it's meant to guide society as a whole. We can't change everybody's minds, but okay. when we talk about behavior change, we're talking about the general um, behavior of the, the, the specific society, the population, yep. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So there is the unintended consequence of people just pulling and just hope just to see it go down, you know, literally watching the world burn, stuff like that. Hello. And how but we can't, we can't, yeah, there, there are unintended consequences. Uh, the, the thing about nudges is, um, when you implement something, it's flexible enough for you to switch it up. Because it's not expensive to implement something like this. So you put it there and you realize that, okay, actually our uh, paper towels are going down a lot more than usual. So you know what, let's just scrap it. Let's just mm. look into it and see how we can change it and stuff. So that's the thing about nudges. It's flexible, okay. you can just stop it. It's not something that costs a million dollars of taxpayers money to implement just to see it fail. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm hearing that it's somewhat easy to implement. It shouldn't be very costly mm. or yep. 
I mean, cost shouldn't be the determining factor of whether a nudge is, a nudge is effective or not or to be, to be implementable. Mm. Uh, yeah. What I'm also hearing here is that a nudge here, um, sometimes people always confuse it as, hey, actually, this, isn't this just a very good design? Isn't this just marketing? What, what's what's mm. the big deal about this thing called nudge? How come it's got suddenly this thing called nudge as well? It's, isn't, isn't the picture shown just a form of good marketing that, you know, uh, that, mm -hmm. that we have done a really good job in doing? What, how do we see, what are your thoughts? So, okay, the difference between marketing and nudge is um, a, a marketing kind of, marketing points you towards a product, makes you want to buy something. It's, it's basically a company, their end goal is for you to buy something or, you know, create brand awareness of that specific brand. A nudge, when we talk about nudge, um, we are hoping that people will nudge for good. So in the realm of sustainability, we want to nudge people towards either using less of a, of a certain resource or be more aware of the whole sustainability issues. Um, marketing, marketing ultimately, right, the end goal is for you to, is to buy a certain product or to buy into the brand or to buy into the message. It, it's not necessary that it's a good thing. Um, it, the focus on marketing is what needs to be sold. So they may, mm -hmm. there, there might not be an alternative, whereas nudge is, you can do this, but you don't have to. So there are other alternatives. There's freedom of choice. Marketing can be restrictive. It can be deceptive at times, if, mm. we, if we really think about it. <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. Because you know, I, I guess uh, there's always been an idea that marketing itself uh, nudging is like a new thing again like how come there's so many new concepts coming along but what I'm hearing here is it's really about just understanding human behavior now and, and the motivation yes. behind doing this rather than the, and it's the, it's, it's, it, it's the means of doing so rather than the, in, the intent mm -hmm. which is marketing is trying to help us to consume or purchase something yeah. whereas this has a little bit more of a mm -hmm. invitation invitation maybe a way to see it is let me try to phrase it better um marketing can have nudges okay but nudge but nudges should not focus on marketing okay you know what i'm saying um of course the term marketing is also pretty broad people can say that if i want to if i want someone to engage in a certain behavior i'm marketing that behavior mm. but if you want to nudge for good it should be you know what let's get people to let's maybe promote the idea of sustainability which is different from, in a way, different from marketing. Because marketing focuses on consuming profits, purchase. So if we want to define the difference between marketing and nudge, marketing talks about money to a company, products to be sold, KPIs to be met. Uh, nudge is, let's try to reduce, let's try to point people in a desirable behavior. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, I shall show you one of ours uh, from Green Nudge itself. This is what we've been doing. Uh, and we'd like to see what that you? How, how this, no, this is not me actually. It's all <laughs> our volunteers that we had at our event. Okay, yeah. So basically, we wanted to get people to bin their uh, banana peels when they have collected them. And mm -hmm. uh, in order for them to kind of see it from far when they have eaten the banana peels from the point of, yeah. this is actually at the finishing point where uh, we have got volunteers stationed around the area. With a, mm -hmm. a bin, and we actually had separate beans just for banana peels so that we can mm -hmm. collect them for compost. But because where the, the bananas are distributed to where they're going to be thrown, it's quite a distance. So we needed yeah. to have people in mascots or even, even the, the signs as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Is this a nudge as well? It is definitely an informational nudge. Okay. Uh, I think it yeah, attracts attention, definitely. Uh huh. The, the small feature environment is this guy in a mascot costume, which must be like really hot to be wearing in Singapore. Super hot. Yeah. <laughs> this so was taken like 10, 10, 11 a.m. Yes. Oh, that's like, right. That's like peak period for, for the sun. That's right. Um, it's definitely a nudge. Uh, an informational nudge, you have people doing it and it's, it's, it doesn't cost a lot to implement as well. Um, and a way, you know, like the cute image kind of just makes it look like makes it reminds people that i would say remind people it is cute um so it's so the it emotional uh it, it, it's the emotional uh 
that the emotions that's being invoked here a, a way of mm. not just self is that an impact i don't think people feel emotional <laughs> looking at that the image they probably think it's cute mm. um but given the cynicism of <laughs> society in general there might be a number of people brushing it off as a gimmick Mm, okay, so that's just that's so, just me being that's just me being cynical. I probably want cynics. Okay, okay. Yeah. So if it's used too often, it could also then just become another. People might be numb mm. towards it, or people might just be numb towards it, and yeah, uh, might see it as a form yeah, of marketing as well. Behavioral fatigue, yeah, because because there's your brand there, and uh, people don't really like if they don't really know what your 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 company is about, or they don't bother searching it, they might think it's just. A company trying to promote itself mm. through this okay. initiative. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'm just I'm just being cynical. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a there's a there's a silver lining somewhere. In this. I just can't oh, think sure. of it right now. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so I think this was helpful when we were doing the events, really, because when mm. when it was not just about the science that kind of encouraged people to throw the pins mm. uh the the pews properly. It was the fact that because there was a continuous stream of people holding on to banana pews. Mm. Excuse me, walking past the bins, right? And they were throwing it, and it was became it became very continuous. It became yeah. some sort of a a habit during that event itself yeah. that people so, started to follow. So, so you said there was a line of people, right? Yeah. So so that's 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 social norms right there. Um, nobody, and nobody would. I mean, I won't say nobody, but people who see other people having eating a banana, holding a pill, would be like, oh, let's just follow this line. You know, Singaporeans you love to queue, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. you just follow lines for no reason. So we look at this line, we just go. <laughs> um, and it, 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 it invites people. People subconsciously, it's like, hey, the guy has a pill, so maybe you know, he knows where to throw. There seems to be a, lot of people, a group of people queuing up to throw their banana pills. They just join them. So I, I suppose then the, the nudge in this case right, became more of the, person's, the, the other people's behavior as compared mm -hmm. to really about... Um, that signboard really perhaps it would have been the ones to encourage people to to bin via mm. that signboard first but then after a while it yep. really just followed other people's behavior is that correct yeah so the signboard works it's like the uh like our mrt stations our train station in singapore there's a sign that tells people to keep left and people who want to overtake can just go on the right side okay so that sign works up to a point where I think if, you, if, if most of us think about it, we don't really know where that sign is now. We just know that there'll be a line of people on the escalator keeping left and therefore we will follow. So that's social norms. So the sign works up to a point and eventually, you know, social norms are, can, social norms are actually quite powerful and they can actually be the, what, the, the, the nudge that guides society into a that direction. Okay, so I'm, so I'm hearing two things from here as in mm. okay so in singapore for instance uh we queue on the left hand side when we come to an escalator uh especially mm. the train stations and let's say we open up the right lane for people who need to walk up and down uh, walk up uh, yeah. the, sta uh, the stairs um and uh what i'm hearing is that people are influenced by just people standing on the left hand side of the escalator mm. for one and it's reinforced by the fact that if let's say if you stand on the right and someone needs to cross they will let you and say they'll ask you to they'll probably out. tap you on the shoulder or they'll like they'll just you know like try to be passive aggressive and like you know, behind you trying to like okay. get your attention <laughs> yep yep so that's and, and because of that it's reinforcing am i yep. am i hearing that correctly so it's, it's, it's a, also, so it, it's also multiple nudges at play here is that is that is that the case and it's not just about one nudge equals to one action or one outcome uh there yeah, can be multiple nudges multiple I mean, it can be multiple nudges leading to one outcome. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, because I I I I think that the train, the the queue on the escalator has been a really really fantastic and effective one because mm. we have not seen a lot of signs around after a while and the mm. fact that many more people started to do this right um it really just got people to kind of just stick for now and it's not just about the train escalators it's also about even the queues in uh, our train stations as well uh, at the, mm -hmm. the more crowded ones you also see people queuing up and, and things like that yep. and the fact was the lines that the queue lines on the train station at, at the train stations were actually there for quite a while but no one actually 
pay attention yep. to it. But it's only the last few years that this started com coming along. Yeah. yeah. The thing about this is not just um, depending on the society, uh, the change can be slow. Um, but once the change is made, it's pretty enduring. And I think I think that's the, the thing I need to stress here. We want behavior change that's enduring. And it's not not just a, a one off um, one off uh, one off what do you call that? Switch and then people switch back. You know what okay. I'm saying? So it's like in the case of the uh, plastic bag initiative in Singapore. I'm not sure mm. if there's data uh, surrounding it, but I is it is it there is there is a there's definitely a drop after you put a financial incentive or even a ban on plastic bags in these low markets. Um, but we need to measure. We need the measure. The measurement needs to go on for a while because there are studies out there that show that when you put on these these mandates, these bans, uh, the behavior the behavior change show that plastic usage drops. But after a while, it comes back up in other forms. So like bin liners, in reusable plastic bags, in different forms of plastic. And when we see this, right, that's not behavior change. That's a behavior shift. You know, the you the outcome, the desirable outcome was for people to use less plastic. But what they end up using is using more other forms of plastic. So okay, yeah. So that is that's the difference. Um, with with Singapore's because I don't think there's any data out there. Uh, after the whole financial incentive, I mean, it makes sense for after a ban and a and a tax, right? It makes sense for a plastic use to drop. You know, it is almost like some, it's almost logical in a sense, but human behavior is not logical. So at some point, you know, we should be able to measure for a longer period and see if the behavior shift to other forms of plastic. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. So, so there are quite, quite a number of things that I'm hearing here that uh, I just mm -hmm. want to clarify once more. Right? So we are talking about a behavior shift here. And first of all, foremost, I'm, I'm hearing it can't just, it will not happen overnight. It needs to be yeah. pretty long to, to encourage that change to happen and I think because of that mm -hmm. it has to be a little bit more frequent in getting that to okay. happen so the touch point must be more regular it has to be even not just about uh, depending on the, the action or what you want to do it has mm -hmm. to be either on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis for some right so yep. so it's things like the contentious part let's say about even plastic bag charge and stuff is that it only happens when we go to a supermarket and, and purchase uh, groceries. And then at the counter itself, that's where we see the, uh, the need to whether, consider whether we need to bring our own bags or even use the plastic bags yep. over there as well. So, that, that, so but I'm, now I'm hearing you saying like, because of this charge, people will start to shift, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it may still lead to other kinds of behavioral change stemming from the plastic bag charge because I, I think there's always been this discussion about plastic bag charge in Singapore as well. Mm -hmm. So the point and then the question I guess it would be to ask is uh, do you think a plastic bag charge is useful in Singapore? Um, we need to study it a bit longer because um, we have seen this charge, these charges uh, being implemented in other countries in Ireland. In Ireland, it was introduced in about 2002, 2003. Okay. Um, what happened was they charged it, plastic bag use dropped. But after a while, it went back up. Mm, okay. And, and then they increased the charge. Went back down again. I think it went back up again. And then they okay. increased. And then I, I, didn't, I didn't really follow that thing after all. But what, what, what pointed out, well, one of the things that pointed out that really stood out to me was human behavior, if we really want to use plastic, right? Uh, it is almost like, uh, if, if our behavior don't shift, if there's no lasting change in our mindset to use less plastic, right? You can have like multiple incentives coming in and incentives or bans coming in, right? But it still shift us towards other things. So even a plastic bag ban, you ban single use plastic bag in supermarkets. But you don't. Um, but the mindset in the, in the plastic use don't change. They end up buying uh, bin liners to bin their rubbish. They end up buying other forms of plastic to uh, uh, to satiate their desire for plastic, like like it's a drug. But um, yeah, uh, and and I, I like to correct myself. Not all nudges can uh, are slow. Uh, 
enduring behavioral change can take a while, um, but it's not all like, not, not like glacial slow, but it definitely takes a while to change. Okay. Especially when it's something that is uh, so, so prevalent in our life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so that takes a while to set in for me as well. Because <laughs> what I'm also hearing right now is that actually a passive charge, mm. is it really effective or mm. uh, is it not effective? It also really depends on how we are behaving in response yeah. to that. It can't just be an, uh, a blank assumption that just because mm. it works in other countries, it will work here in Singapore. And neither can we also mm. assume that just because uh, we have implemented a charge, it will disappear as well. Because yeah. uh, right in Singapore, for disposables, we actually, if you go to Hawker Centre and you do a takeaway, you're already being imposed that say 20 cents more for your disposables. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we don't see that coming along uh, as discouraging or, or the usage of disposables dropping as yeah. well. In fact, right now, everyone has to use disposables because of this, this uh, pandemic as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, can I just say, would uh, cost implementing, implementing a charge financial disincentives here is it useful as a nudge or is it not really a nudge in the first place? It cannot be the only form. So like, like how what we said earlier, right? Nudges can be multiple nudges pointing us to one direction. Okay. That, that um, incentive, no, it's not incentive. It's actually a penalty if they charge. So that little penalty uh, with other form of nudges can also, should, they, it should be accompanied by other nudges. You know what I'm saying? It cannot be a solo solo uh what's the word solo kia you know what i'm saying it needs it needs a team and not just work like a team <laughs> it needs to work in tandem with other nudges with or others. other yes correct <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah especially right. something that um so the, the thing about surrounding plastic right is boils down to convenience uh it is something that's convenient it's something that um Something that if you take away, right, people, the first thing that comes from people's mind is, it's just like, how do I put it? Inconvenience is a very powerful form of uh, behavior change. Uh, a form of, um, wait, let me, let me try to rephrase that. Inconvenience can prevent positive behavior change. Uh, <clears throat> If you're also used to having plastic bags uh, freely available to us at the checkout, you take that away, or oh, there will be there will be hell to pay, mob justice. You know, people will complain. Uh, there will be a lot of anger. There will be boycotts. You know, like you take away this thing. Um, and the thing about inconvenience is, um, it's not the cause of sustainability not being practiced. Yeah, it's uh, it makes it that much more difficult. Okay. Yeah. And if we can address the idea of making inconvenience, uh, the inconvenience of not having plastic bags readily available at soon markets, we can address that in a way that cause people to readily accept the inconvenience. Uh, Singaporeans don't accept that inconvenience so easily. But the thing is, if you think about it, we, 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 we do a lot of inconvenient things every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Such as before the before the pandemic, we we wash our cars. Uh, it's inconvenient, takes up time, but we want our cars to look nice. Okay. Uh, for the ladies, for for not just ladies, you know, we put on makeup. We want to look good. We style our hair. We think about what we want to wear the next day. We spend probably a few minutes in, to maybe a few hours in front of the mirror, trying to mix match our clothes to look good. That's inconvenient, but we still okay. do it. You know, and if we can harness that towards getting people to bring reusable bags to the market, uh, it's, it, it, there is, there will be a big change. Like if people don't see it as inconvenient, but something that is, uh, you know, maybe helps them look good, you know, if it's, that could be, it sounds like greenwashing, but, but, you know, social norms when everyone's doing it, uh, more people, more people doing it. Uh, it becomes second nature for people to just bring these bags, and suddenly that inconvenience become becomes a trend. Becomes a trend. So, so it's really about the motivations behind it. And I think, and I'm, what what I'm hearing here is that it can't just be like, oh, because uh, other other people are doing it in this manner, we just copy and paste that action, and that we assume mm -hmm. that this action is going to generate the same response or behavior. 
but it's really about the motivation behind it. Is, yeah. is that what I'm hearing? hearing? Because, um, yeah, so I, I'm going to change a bit of the topic here because I, I'm, I'm, a lot of the topics that we have seen, right, a lot of the, uh, even the examples that we've seen that, uh, that mm-hmm. shared, besides my own example, I would say that most of the examples shared widely on nudges and stuff seems to stem from, let's say, uh, in, in, in Europe or in America or in Western culture itself where perhaps there is already a sense of civic responsibility and whatnot. But I'm just wondering, how can we actually, for those, for, in, for individuals who are actually keen on looking at creating nudges, or especially in an Asian context where things are a bit different as well, how, how can we actually look at that? Because I am also sensing like um, things like social norms, for instance. Social norms seems to be rather broad. And if we can contextualize to even in an Asian culture, uh, how would that look like? Uh, is there any examples or, or things that we can even look at or in case I just share on that. Social norms in an Asian context. If if I bring up an example that is not uh, not sustainable, okay, but it is a social norm. The uh, Confucian value of mian zi. All right. So if you go to mian, someone's mian house, is, is, mian is in face. English face. Uh, this yeah, is a friend of mine. Asian. Yeah. Concept of phase, is it saving phase? Yeah, this, this, this term was actually found in an academic paper. A friend of mine pointed me to this paper and okay. I, I, thought, I thought like, you know, it's so true. Uh, it, it's so true, but I, don't, I didn't really think about it until I was pointed to that paper. And mianzi is like, let's say we in, for Chinese, uh, the abundance of food on the table is a form of mianzi, it's a form of um, phase, like, 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 like my reputation, my... Um, okay. My, my how I look you know to the people and food a huge number uh, a large factor of food waste in Singapore is largely due to especially during Chinese New Year food waste because we over order we prepare way too much food we don't finish the food and we throw them away the, and this is a social norm that is in some at some point is still generally accepted because we it's almost a given that there should be more than enough. Uh, your rice, your rice bowl should be more than enough. It should be overflowing with abundance. It is a very um, Chinese uh, culture to have that. So in terms of social norms, the fact that only until recently that we penalize it, or not, I won't say penalize it, only until recently that we start to look at it like, hey, that, that's actually a problem. Can we harness that? Can we change okay. that? Um, so that is a social norm that uh, we need to kind of shift away All right. with nudges. <laughs> so there's also a cultural aspect here in a sense because I guess in the Asian culture, having abundance of food even after a meal, right, seems to suggest mm-hmm. that the, uh, it, this is a relatively wealthy or the, uh, there's a, you enjoy wealth and, and you don't lack of anything. So mm-hmm. what I'm hearing is that and if you don't do that, there is this disgrace or this uh, uh, being, being shameful, uh, some sort some of a uh, shame if let's say you cannot, you know, meet that 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 requirement as well. Yes. So so is, yeah. so if we need to change that, how do we actually change it as well? So I I'm just understanding this because I'm also trying to understand this because it seems like the motivations seem to be a lot more internal in this case. It really isn't about like um in this case it's internal, but it's also reinforced by um norms from external how people perceive us and whatnot. So. Mm. So in order for us to create a, a good notch or an effective notch as well, uh, which should we tackle actually? The, in, the internal, in, the, in, in the internal uh, motivation or do we rely on external stimulus as well? Do we get, do we get uh, people to tell us it's not great and things like that? Or perhaps I think it's a combination both. of both. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a combination of both. <laughs> I think we just mm. answered you. <laughs> um, uh, that's, that's the thing, like, I've, I've been thinking about it, like, how we can tackle uh, food waste in Singapore, like, even among, in my, even in my own family, right? Okay. Like, so make it less like cool to having, waste food. Having less cool, uh, like, you, like you just said, there's a shame when it comes to, like, currently, the norm is there's a shame when you don't have enough. Or, yep. though, or, or if others perceive that you don't have enough, there's a shame there. So shame works. Um, so that's social norms, right? Um, if you don't have this, you know, there's a bit of shame. So you must say, like, out in public now, it's a bit Asian shame. cuisine people, is fine dining, then have less food, then it looks very atas. Then people will feel like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, 
uh, Asian, I think if we do away with less buffet style and okay. food, you know, uh-huh. and you'll be able to control your food waste based on your plate sizes. So that's a nudge as well. You know, even in like out there, there are studies that show that plate sizes actually control food waste and stuff. Um, shame works as a social norm if we are able to change the social norm first. So it is going to be a very hard upward push uh, to change that idea that uh, abundance, abundance do not have to be reflected in how you present food to people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, at some point, right, when, when is enough enough? <laughs> when is having enough food actually a good thing? Probably shows that you have better planning. If you have enough food instead of abundance and, you, and everybody like, oh, you over plan, you over budget, blah, blah, blah. That kind of thing. Yeah, so it's, uh, I don't have all the answers. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I must admit, we, uh, I think this discussion, <laughs> we, seems to, we, we seem to be piling a lot of expectation on Ian, the behavioral change expert, to tell us every single thing, but I don't think it's the case. It's really about just sharing some thoughts here. And I don't, and I, and I do hope that, let's say, whoever, uh, if, if you're viewing this as well, it's really just food for thought here to see how can we further introduce, uh, understand some of these principles, to see how we can evolve and, and, and also apply into our own context here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what Yen has also shown or shared over here, right, has the, has, 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 it's quite a, quite a rich uh, a learning point here, which is that I must say, nudges can't just be applied wholesale. We can't just assume that it works in this place, mm-hmm. it'll work for this, this country or this area as well. It is contextual, right? And it has a bit of a relevancy. So if I infer from that, right, the best people to introduce a nudge has to also be people who are who understand the place well, the people's motivations about there, as well. There definitely needs to be research done before you implement nudge. So nudge, nudge can be an ongoing thing where you first research, you look at the landscape. Okay. Uh, the landscape is supermarkets. Let's say because I have, I have a paper that's on preprint about nudge, using nudges to um, reduce plastic bag use among customers, right? So right. I'll use that as an example. Okay. You do a research on the supermarket. You, start, you measure how much plastic, like before the implementation, you measure how much plastic is being consumed, all forms of plastic. Okay. You implement the nudge and then you measure, does it work? Do you see the numbers drop? And if, you, if it doesn't work, if you see numbers go in the opposite direction, okay, scrap it. Look in, look at the look at the data again, and just adjust accordingly. So that's how nudges are flexible. Mm. Nudges is not like the, it's not like the uh, the the magical equation that answers all of life questions. It's not an answer. It is a potential. It is a potential um, solution that needs to work in tandem with other solutions. That should okay. be intended with other solutions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one one of the comments I I I am seeing here is let's say uh, we go back a little bit on let's say uh the nudge or, or the 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 ballot bin for cigarette butts as well. I think mm-hmm. one of the points is that uh if you have to place that bin itself right, we actually will that also then lead to more smokers to uh to smoke more mm-hmm. and that yeah. uh you know so that they can actually have the choice to 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 win that 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 that. that, that 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 yeah. as well. So there how is, how do you think about that as well? There is that unintended consequence. But okay, so the ballot bin, right? The ballot bin, I would say that the behavior outcome of the ballot bin is to reduce cigarette butt waste. It yep. is not to reduce smoking in general. Okay. Um, to reduce smoking in general, a form of nudge can be like you know the really gross pictures on the yep. cigarette boxes. That okay. that's a nudge to prevent people from smoking more. Um, but if how it works is because you want to maintain freedom of choice. People want to yep. smoke, you know, you shouldn't stop them. But if they're going to dispose of their, their butts, you know, let's give them an option where they won't be just throwing on the ground and then having it end up in the ocean. Uh, let's give them, let's, 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 help, let's help them, let's help them behave in a way where it's sustainable, uh, where we will not have the, bit, the butt end up in the ocean. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's not, the ballot bin itself is not to solve the smoking uh, problem or to, to prevent, to reduce the number of smokers, but it's more to reduce the waste that comes out of smoking. 
Yeah, and I, I presume if that's the case, then it shouldn't be placed in areas where there was no smoking in the first place. Like it shouldn't be placed in, mm. let's say, uh, a place in where... a smoking zone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I guess it, it, it's, it's more useful in a smoking zone or where smoking mm. is really more prevalent in a sense. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah, it, it adjust, like, adjust the yeah, adjust the bin size accordingly. If there's like a lot the of smokers and your bin is like and your bin's like the size of a cup, then you know you probably have some waste on the ground because there's a limit to how much they can stuff in there. I see. I see. Yeah. So, so all this it, it sounds like it's it's the art of science here. Really have to understand what mm -hmm. exactly people are behaving, they're thinking of, and then implementing it. And then mm -hmm. there appears to be also an angle of having data where we need to actually yeah. measure before and after and then to see whether it works mm -hmm. and things like that. So it sounds very hard as well. It, but I, I, I guess intuitively, it doesn't seem to be that case. And it appears that mm -hmm. everyone can also do that as well. And I just say for people who are um, doing this at home in their own lives as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what kind of a um, tips will you be able to give them for people who are looking at sharing or doing more nudges at home. And I think we can even talk just about green nudges per se. How about let's say your own life? How, how, yeah. And how does that happen for people who like to even practice how to use nudges in their own lives? Okay, one way I'll, I'll just use a personal experience. Um, I have my food basket, right? That was in the corner of the kitchen. And what I've noticed is that my, the fruits I buy, like I'll go to the supermarket, right? I'll be very optimistic. You know, that's, that's one of the flaws of humans. We are very optimistic. I'll be like, oh, I have to buy this number of apples. I buy this number of bananas. You know, I'm going to have, I'm going to live a healthy lifestyle. I'm going to eat more fruits. I buy, I put them in a the food basket that's in the corner of my kitchen, but it's largely out of sight. Okay. And next thing I know, at the end of the week, uh, the banana is rotted. The apples is kind of brown. And I thought to myself, like, how, how, how am I going to nudge myself to eat more fruits? I can buy all the things, but I will end up not eating the fruits if I don't. And I realized that I end up not eating it because I don't see as much. So what I do is I put my fruit basket, I'm looking at it right now, it's right in the middle of my kitchen. So it's very visual. It's uh, Wait, very it visual. It's not very visual. It's very visible. Um, it's right here. You can see it right there. Is it visible? I can, can see it banana. Yeah, yeah, so that's the food basket. <laughs> okay. It, it used to be in that corner. <laughs> okay. Hidden behind those stuff. So, yeah, so that, that was the thing. I, I nudged myself to eat more food. So I, I, end up, I do eat more foods, a lot more foods now. Okay. So that's one way of how I can nudge myself. Um, if you, if you and I, an idea that came across my mind is like, if I want to drink more water at home, uh, I know in, my, in a lot of Singapore homes, especially my home, right, we are kind of, we're kind of used to the idea of this uh, very insignificant looking, uh, what do you call it, water pourer thing. What do you call it? A pitcher. Um, a pitcher. Yes, sorry. The words are escaping me right now. Um, so, what, what I, an idea is to probably change that water pitcher into something attractive. A mason jar, you know, those clear mason jars with the dispenser thing so it yep. like you know a nudge is some is a small feature in the environment that attracts your attention and alters your behavior so if that thing can attract your attention and make you want to drink more water that's a nudge for some people a, a very colorful water feature might work i am not advocating people to buy more stuff consumption <laughs> don't don't over consume but you can use what's around the house right now and attract yourself maybe you know put a little bright yellow post sticks on your water pitcher right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it attracts your attention, like it'll, it'll, it'll alter you to drink more water. So it's some form of a prom, like a reminder. A prom, yes. That's one of the nudges. Uh, that's, that's considered a nudge, a prom, a reminder. Yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so, okay, we have got a question actually by uh, Teresa, I think. Uh, so this question is about how, how about the, uh, how much change can you alone make mentality? How much change? So, if I want to understand that question a bit better, am I right to say that as one person, I can't do a lot? That's the thing with nudges. We have seen how we are standing left on escalators yeah. in MRT stations. Everyone in Singapore is doing that, save mm -hmm. for a few people who want to watch the world burn. <laughs> okay. Everyone is doing that. So, 
Nudges is a very ground up initiative, I would say. It can be implemented top down, mm. but we know how bureaucracies work, right? If nudges take a while to take effect, and you know, if it's top down, it's probably going to take a while for them to implement this. It'll be very glacial. So, uh, private organizations, you know, you can start doing things like in your company, uh, like what I did with my home, you know, I nudge myself to eat more fruits. Uh, constant reminders. How much, how much an individual can make in mentality? Just like how nudges need to work in tandem with other nudges, we can all work alone to achieve sustainability. Can I just say that? <laughs> I don't have all the answers. Um, okay, but I'm, what I'm hearing is that it, also, it really must start from somewhere. Like, I guess starting yeah. for ourselves start, first. Start, if we start can. somewhere. Okay, mm-hmm. so starting uh, in our own household or you know, just getting our own change to happen more, more frequently, more permanently. Like you know, mm-hmm. having a reusable bag let's say at the door before we head out or even packing a reusable bag in our bag in our own uh, grocery bag or something so that at least mm-hmm. it's brought over. Yep. I guess um, what I'm saying, I'm, he- I'm hearing here like, that it has to start from somewhere and then if you're used to that and we can and then amplify that work by either influencing our friends, our colleagues and to do so and to, and to grow that movement or that momentum yeah. as well. Like. Make, 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 it, make, it, make it a normal thing to do. Um, I know that, I know I have some friends who think that bringing their own bags to the supermarket is uh, feminine. Okay. It's not a bad thing. Uh, in Australia, it's almost a norm for mm-hmm. get all genders to bring their own uh, bags to the supermarket. Okay. So, I do it. Uh, in Singapore, if I do it, uh, sometimes the cashier, the lead, the cashier at uh, NTUC will be quite surprised <laughs> when I bring my own bag to them. <laughs> it's just the bag. Okay, okay. Then she take it out of that plastic bag and she do the thing. And there is that. The surprise from the cashier is not a bad thing. It's, uh, it's almost like a pleasant surprise. So, I don't think it's frowned upon. I think as even as guys, we overthink this whole masculinity thing a bit too much. There is nothing feminine about bringing this. I I don't know why we're attaching gender <laughs> labels to like bringing us mm. back to so much. Okay. Um, one way to make it more attractive is to make the bags attractive. Uh, culturally, you can just make it more uh, gender neutral. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like I know there are out there are bags out there. There's a lot of flowers in there, and most guys would be like, "Ooh, a lot of flowers, so colorful." So because uh, it saved the environment so much, have a lot save the earth, must have a lot of flowers, a lot of trees, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, but we, I, uh, the reusable bags in Australia in Woolies and Coles is just a plain green with, of course, their branding on it. Yep. But you know, there's it's, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's not a lot of design put into it. But there are ones with designs, and definitely attract people to use them more. Okay, so I, I guess the idea here is to shape the whole um, mm. norm or the, the mentality here that it is actually uh, not just, uh, it is not uncool to use a thing, but it's actually trendy to do something along that line as well. Mm, make, it, make it trendy, start, start, start. Uh, but without start being too, yeah. but without being too, uh, what do you call it? Too, too, too common is it? Listen, because you because you you're also saying earlier that it, if it if it becomes too regular, then actually people might not pay attention to it. Oh, I think if it becomes too regular, people will actually people will stop paying attention to it because they end up doing it. It becomes a uh, it becomes intuitive. It, it's, be like, it's a oh, shift I'm going out. Yeah, so that that that's when you that's when you can say it's a shift. The thing about behavior change is that it's not something that you feel like oh I feel that people behavior change can be measured. There is you can actually have data to show that you know behavior change, the the, the change happened. Okay. Uh, so the, that's the key thing about behavior change. It, it's not something that is by feeling or oh I think there are a lot of people doing this. It can be measured, and oh. there's a whole science to it as well. Yeah. Okay. So 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 for people who like to just understand because this is not shadow agree not one hundred one or some sort um, some sort as well mm-hmm. right so. If people like to just really better understand what, what nudge is, um, where can they go to find out more? Where can they read up about this? Or what, what's the thing to do? Read up about it. This book. 
start off with this book. <laughs> it is it's written by a behavioral economist and a legal scholar. So it's quite readable. It's there are a lot of examples in there. Um, they also have a website called nudges.org. Right, so it's right. kind of like it's kind of like a web page where people just talk about all the nudges they see, people discuss about it. Um, and find out more about nudges. Uh, you know, we can we can even like contact me, we have a chat about it. What okay. nudges, the difference between nudges and mandates, how we can have it. Uh, in your office. So like what Richard Taylor says about nudges is a small feature in your environment that captures your attention and alters your behavior. So when you talk about the environment, it can be your home environment, it can be your office environment, it can be the natural environment, it can even be the digital environment where we talk about um, uh, like you know your phones, your interface, there is a digital environment that you can have nudge in, that you can have mm -hmm. elements of nudges in. So that is, um, nudges can be everywhere. And I think I remember you saying before that nudges uh, is almost like a mysterious thing, right? Like one of our- it Sounds very mysterious for people who look at it sometimes. It's, 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 it's a- Magic. It's, <laughs> it's not, okay. Not just is not mysterious. It, it is, um, I think an effective nudge is one that a, a, a large portion of us don't pay attention to. That's an effective nudge. A nudge, uh, a nudge triggers your, uh, triggers our um, automatic behavior. Okay. So we have automatic behavior and we have like a reflective behavior. So it's like one plus one equals two. That's your automatic behavior. 297 times 12, that is a reflective behavior because it takes you a while to, to think about it. Uh, so we spend most of our time at work engaging in reflective behavior. So when it comes to other things, we don't want to uh, think too much, which is why convenience is convenience uh, harnesses a lot of our automatic behavior. Okay. It sounds like there's a lot to share and then there's a lot to kind of know as well. But I think what I'm hearing from the last hour or so of just sharing is, and I think um, besides what nudges are, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm just hearing from, let's say, for someone who is keen on trying it out. I think here are some of the things that I'm just thinking about here. Is that it doesn't have to be like a large scale on at once. It can really just start small in our own household, in our own lives, and then sharing with, let's say, groups of friends, colleagues, or with a, a, group, a larger group of people later on as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I almost start hearing that in order for this to take place, you know, really more effectively, you probably have to just understand the motivation as well. Like, um, what exactly is the response that, that's generated when we do something? And, mm -hmm. and if we can do that, and we can now suggest something to, to, to change that behavior, it right. also takes time. So I don't think we can all expect things to change overnight, but yeah. it will take a while to, be, to get, collect some data, like, basically, and then see how to change along that side. And it probably... Yeah. May not always work the first time, and therefore we might have to even repeat it a few times to kind of just shape it to uh, the the right response or the appropriate response that we want to see. Yeah, I, uh, right to kind of summarize it, and then yeah, the thing about about, about nudges is uh, there's something I wanted to say. Uh, the thing about nudges is um, okay. The thing about human behavior is that uh, we are not as rational as we think we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, we can fill up surveys, we can say on interviews that, you know, yes, we, we know plastic is bad, therefore I'll use less plastic. You know, we know plastic is bad, therefore I'll use less plastic. Um, but how we behave at the end, right, is, is crunch time. That's where nudges can actually help, help us uh, act according to what we believe. So like there's this thing called stated preferences and revealed preferences. So stated preferences are things that you say you will do in surveys, uh, in interviews, um, but there's also this phenomenon called the Hawthorne effect where we change our, our behavior because we are being watched. Uh, when you do a survey, the person asking you, you know, you want to, of course, appear, appear to answer the right answers, give the right impression and stuff like that. But when it comes to actually doing the stuff that we say we'll do, right? When it comes to the zone market, we walk out of the house, we forgot to bring our, our reusable bags. Do we turn back and get the bags? Or do we like, I, uh, you know what, another mm. time. And that's where, that's, that's how our 
that's how we reveal our preferences where what we say and what we do is totally different. Can be totally different. Yeah, so what nudges do is to, you say you do this, let us help you. Let, let's have all these little uh, features and environment to kind of like remind you, uh, you know, someone's bringing their back, social norms, you know, pushes you to want to bring your own bags, stuff like that. Okay. Okay. So it sounds it sounds like quite really a lot of uh, information that's being shared right now. Uh, and unfortunately, I think we also are running out of time as well. So I, can I also then say that uh, if let's say people are interested in know a little bit more, besides you know mm -hmm. looking at the uh, the book that you are sharing as well, would people mm -hmm. be able to just reach out to you? Um, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for, for those who are you know interested in just understanding what what behavior not just our like and um, mm -hmm. how behavioral change can take place, I would say, feel free to contact Yin. Okay, a little we will share um, his uh, LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn, LinkedIn uh, mm -hmm. profile at the end of our video. And then um, hopefully we can have more discussions beyond this one hour chat that we have. <laughs> All right. Any last words or not, I think, from, have, from Yin? Do you have any other questions to answer? Like, do you answer everything or? or we don't know what we're going to ask. Um, I think when it comes to any last words from, okay, I probably want to finish off by saying that when it comes to sustainability, uh, it may seem very, um, how do I put it? It may seem like a very, uh, it may not seem like it's uh, gaining any traction now, especially the pandemic. Uh, reusables are being used a lot more, disposables are being consumed at a faster rate than usual. Just, and just as we were talking about banning plastic bags or, or taxing plastic bags, the pandemic came and suddenly all this just becomes the back of everyone's mind. Yeah. Mm, I would say that this, you know, in the elections, right, the PAP loves to say, never, never waste a crisis. Uh, the same goes for sustainability. Never waste this crisis. If anything, climate change and sustainability is very much tied to this whole pandemic. Um, there are studies that show that the pandemic is a result of uh, overconsumption in terms of the resources and stuff like that. So what we can do uh, is to you know, encourage each other, keep going, keep nudging people, uh, keep reminding, uh, keep thinking of, of many of, keep, keep thinking of ways to just really uh, work towards achieving sustainability because once the pandemic has a vaccine, uh, this virus has a vaccine, there is a medical answer to it. What is the answer to the sustainability or the climate, climate crisis? Uh, what is the vaccine to our climate crisis? I would say it's behavior change. If we mm. all, if we all shift our mindset, if we can all be nudged towards the uh, sustainability solutions, towards practicing those solutions, you know, I think we can. We are like I like I said, behavior change can be measured, and I think we'll be able to measure these differences over time. Yeah. So all right. That's my. Cool. That's my uh, closer. Thank you, thank you. I, 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 and I guess there's a really a lot more that uh, we would love to really share. And I think, mm. um, I do hope that we can have more of such discuss, uh, such of uh, such discussion in the future. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, for those who are really keen to just understand a bit more, if any other questions, feel free to just drop them into the comments below, and then uh, mm -hmm. we'll always be happy to reply to you uh, one way or another. And if we, can't, if we can't address any of those questions right now, we'll be happy to address them later on or in uh, you know email as well. All right, so. Thank you so much, Ian, okay, for your time again. I know that it is pretty late right now in Australia. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, uh, no, so really, really appreciate that you are taking this time out. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, obviously, we'll hope to have more chats of some sort. And for those who are just staying on for this, uh, again, this was a uh, green conversations that we have. Uh, we'd love to be introduce more individuals that talks about sustainability or anything relating to uh, nudging or anything in between as well, uh, basically. And uh, we will be sharing more of such uh, share, uh, conversations in the next few weeks. So please look out for them. And to then, I hope that uh, this, an hour or so of uh, sharing has been useful. And I look forward to you know, sharing more with you in time to come together with the rest of the team. 
All right. So thank you very much again for our time. Have a good evening. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Night. See ya. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank everyone. you very Bye. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>